Do you ever find yourself just asking what is going on? I, I have this... Um, I have this habit, and I'm just going to own it. It's a, it's a bad habit, but I, I find myself all the time in sometimes probably righteous frustration, but more times than not, probably just prideful frustration, kind of just in a little bit of sarcasm asking this, what are we doing? I say this a lot. People on staff have heard me say it so much, they say it back to me. And it's like, oh, I gotta stop saying that. It's just my way of just kind of venting in the moment. We ask this question a lot. What, what is going on? What are we doing? And what we're really asking is why. And when we really begin to ask why, I think there's really two big reasons for why we do this in our life. The first one is we see chaos around us. Uh, there are things that do not make sense. You get this at work, there's a new system, there's a new structure, and you're being told you gotta do this, and you're like, this just doesn't make sense to me, and you go, why, what are we doing? There's things you don't agree with. They don't even have to be big things, and they don't even have to be that personal to you. You can be watching a football game on TV, and they'll run a draw on third and eight, and you go, what are they doing? Why would you do that? Anything that really makes life harder for us. That's why I think so many times we look at our politicians and we ask why, what are they doing? Because there's an expectation that their role is to make life better for us. And so when we see chaos around us, we begin to ask why. We also ask why when we experience personal loss. So loss of provision. We lose our jobs, lose our stuff. Maybe it's loss of status. There's rejection in our social group. Maybe it's loss of comfort or loss of culture. You know, there's traditional expectations that we have. But the big one is loss of life and the death of someone that is close to us. We ask why, why? And we ask from a place of sorrow and a place of hurt and a place where we don't understand and we ask, why? What's going on? And we so desperately want to understand. The detailed answer to that question, that why, isolated to each and every circumstance is beyond us. You have to recognize that. It's also interconnected with all the infinity circumstances at work in God's sovereign plan. It's beyond us. We're not gonna get our mind around that. But there is an ultimate answer to those questions that we have in scripture. It's one of TCBC's guiding principles. We exist for God's glory. We exist for God's glory. Glory. By the way, if you haven't in a long time, I'd encourage you, go back to our website, read through our principles, our practices, and our promises. It's such a good conversation for you to have on the kind of a regular basis in your home as a couple with your family. Just talk through those things. They're really good. But at the top of that, our first principle is that we exist for God's glory. It's ultimately all about him. He is the author and the subject of the story. And few places in scripture really emphasize that why probably more than Ezekiel. It's throughout and it's emphasized and repeated again and again and again. See, people in Ezekiel's life are asking why. They're certainly asking what is going on. God is no longer acting for their comfort or their culture, their status or their fortune. He's actually aiding the enemy. And Ezekiel and his peers are suffering. They're dying and they're losing everything. And in the midst of this, Ezekiel's repeated response that is proclaimed throughout the book is this. It's our big truth. God acts to make his glory known to the nations. God acts 
to make his glory known to the nations. For the glory of God to the nations. That's what we're gonna talk about over the next two weeks. Next week, we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about specifically the nations part of that. But today, we're gonna talk about the glory of God. That God's people are called and set apart to abiding worship and what on earth does that mean? And this is an emphasis throughout a really desperate time in Israel's history. It's around 597 BC and the Babylonians have attacked Jerusalem. Now, in this specific attack, they're gonna spare the city. And you need to understand something about Jerusalem. It's kind of an underlying contextual theme throughout Ezekiel. It's more than just a city. It's not just like their capital. It is their cultural epicenter. Their identity comes back to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem is the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, and the very presence of God. And so in this first kind of wave of attacks on the city, the city's gonna get spared. It's not gonna be destroyed, but Babylon will exile exiles Judah's, <laughs> Judah's 18-year-old king. And so Jehoiakim and a few thousand of Judah's best and brightest are gonna be taken out of the city, taken out of the land, taken captive, enslaved by Babylon. One of those men is named Ezekiel. He's in his mid-20s at this time, and he's a priest in training. His whole life has been kind of dedicated to priestly service. He is training, and at the age of 30, will be initiated into this priestly service, but that hasn't happened yet. And he and others are taken from their homes, taken as captives. Babylon then will set up Zedekiah, uh, Jehoiakim's uncle, as kind of this political puppet king over the city. And it'll be a little over a decade before they come back and completely destroy the city. They'll lay waste to the apple of Israel's eye. There'll be two more really substantial exiles to come. And during this time, two thirds of all of Israel will die, two thirds. I want you to think about how that would feel in the panic. Think about just for a moment, take our context with the coronavirus and think about what the percentages are and think about what that means for us. Now up those percentages to two thirds. This is a difficult time, it is a desperate time. And chapter one begins Five years after Jehoiakim and Ezekiel are removed from their home and taken captive, they are relocated to think like almost like a refugee camp, an enslavement camp, uh, somewhere in southeastern Iraq. That's a long ways from Jerusalem. And Ezekiel is now 30 years old. No doubt, he is thinking about what his life is not. Can you imagine spending your whole life to be a priest, to serve in the temple? And you turn 30 and it was supposed to be graduation. It's supposed to be the initiation. This is what you have worked for and longed for. You dreamed about it. And instead you're enslaved. But in verse three of chapter one, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And chapter one really documents this first vision that is given to Ezekiel, and it, it kind of connects the first 11 chapters of the book. And I got a little confession. Uh, I was 16 the first time I purposed in my heart to read through the Bible. I, I kind of just grew up in church, I was around it, and I thought, you know, I need to read the Bible. That would make sense for what I believe. And so I sat there with my little tape player, and I kind of listened and tried to get through it, and I was just hopping all over the place. And somewhere I said, I'm going to read Ezekiel. I made it about halfway through chapter one and said, I'm going to put this book off. And I skipped it, and I went back around. A little bit later, I came back to it. I got about halfway through chapter one, and I skipped it and said, we're going to put this one back. And I've read all of the other books of the Bible, and Ezekiel, my nemesis, remained. And I had to just press through some of these things. And it's hard. 
And so the thing that I wanna remind you as you're reading through Ezekiel as a church, the main thing is the plain thing and the plain thing is the main thing. There's so many, what, why, so many distractions you can chase throughout Ezekiel. My aim is to stay as close to the main thing as we can, that you can see that theme and help try to connect what's going on uh, in a way that we can just really pragmatically get our mind around. This first vision that's given to Ezekiel in chapter one, Ezekiel sees a storm cloud approaching. I mean, it is the real deal, looks like a hurricane kind of a thing, storm cloud approaching. And in the storm cloud, he sees four winged creatures with four faces kind of going in every which direction. And these winged creatures have their wings extended and on their wings set a platform and on the platform sets a throne. And seated in the throne is a bright and glorious light in the form of a man. And Ezekiel's immediate conclusion is that this is the glory of God, the presence of God. And when he saw it, he fell on his face in verse 28. Now, this vision, like, kind of like Cornelius' vision in Acts, it's a little bit hard for us to get our mind around because we don't quite bring in all the cultural stuff that they have. And so we can easily get distracted by the four faces, what are the big wheels. By the way, there's four big wheels. It's next to each one of these winged creatures. What is all this stuff and what all does it mean? But again, let's zoom out and get the big picture. The most alarming thing in Ezekiel's vision is the presence of God is not with the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. Why is the presence of God in southeastern Iraq? What is that about? That is an alarming proclamation. The wills, the movement of the presence of God departing from Jerusalem. Judah had rebelled. Jerusalem and the temple will fall. And with it, the false hope of a rebellious people, listen, who replaced abiding worship with religious culture, with relig re religiosity, with nationalism, with legalism. They, they took their abiding worship and they replaced it and it's being exposed. And so this is a dark day. The wrath of God is sovereignly at work through Israel's enemy. One third of Israel will be spared. One third will die to the sword and one third will die to disease. Their sons and their daughters will be killed and enslaved. Their families will starve. Their culture will be replaced. The city will be burned and turned to rubble. The temple destroyed and God's presence will move from them. This is the setting in which God calls Ezekiel. And God says to Ezekiel in chapter two, verse four, say to them, thus says the Lord, it goes into verse five, whether they hear or refuse to hear. And that's an important thing in Ezekiel's calling. It gets unpacked further in Ezekiel chapter three, verse four. He said to them, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Catch this, this is important. It is not on the prophet to convert them. That's not what's happening here. See, Israel's not going to listen. And it's not because Ezekiel's not a great orator, it's not because of the method. God's telling them ahead of time, they're not gonna listen to you because the words you're going to proclaim are my words. And they're rejecting me. He goes into verse 17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. 
wherever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. He goes on and he gives this very explicit exchange in verse 18 and further. He says, listen, if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and Ezekiel, you do not go warn them, they're going to die because of their sin and their wickedness. But their blood will be on you and you will give an account. He says, you have a responsibility to go. He says, but if you warn the wicked person, they're still going to die in their wickedness, but their blood will not be on you. This is important because what's happening in Ezekiel's calling is it is being framed around something. Ezekiel's measure of success is not the conversion of the person. Ezekiel's not running around trying to measure his success by the number of converts he's gonna get. Listen, his measurement of success is the faithful proclamation of the word of God. That's his calling. That's our calling as ambassadors. That gets repeated again in Ezekiel chapter 33. We see that again and again. And so Ezekiel, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, begins to boldly expose the sins of the people. He uses words and illustrations that are graphic and direct. Most of us would even acknowledge them as harsh. They lack empathy. But one of the things about that that's really kind of unique too with Ezekiel is Ezekiel is muted in chapter three. God mutes him, so his tongue stuck to the top of his mouth, except when to proclaim the word of God. So as best we can interpret that, what that means is Ezekiel could not, you know, he couldn't just brag about winning his fantasy football season. The only time Ezekiel could speak was to say, thus says the Lord. And so when Ezekiel speaks and Ezekiel teaches, it is a just a powerful proclamation of the word of God. And I, probably because of that and some other visual things, Ezekiel has this very sign-oriented prophetic ministry in which he continues to proclaim truth and the word of God through all these different sign acts. For example, in one of them, he's to build a model of Jerusalem and then destroy it. Now, you hear that and you think, well, you know, you build a model and you destroy it. You don't understand the cultural tension of what that means for Ezekiel. Let, let me give you an example. Let's say today, as we celebrate Independence Day, I want to talk about the sin in our nation. And so I bring in our flag, and I hold up our flag on this stage, and I set our flag on fire for it to burn and be destroyed because of our sin. Now you start to feel the tension. Ezekiel is to destroy Jerusalem. This is hard and it is heavy. He is called to lay on his side for over a year as the scapegoat, eating his food that's cooked over cow dung because of the nastiness of Israel's sin. He has to shave all his hair. He goes on and there's all these just different things that he's doing again and again as these sign acts to expose the sin of the people and the coming consequences. Ezekiel's message asks a lot of him. And if you're reading it and you're sinful maybe like me, you yourself begin to ask why. God, you've already said nobody's gonna change their mind. No, nobody's gonna repent. Why would you put a faithful prophet through all of this? Why make him lay on his side and eat his food that's cooked over cow dung for a year and a half and it's not even gonna make a difference in the immediate? Why? 
God's call on Ezekiel is for the same reason he has called us. For his glory. It's for his glory. Keep reading and it, as we go through, pay special attention to Ezekiel's continued proclamation for the glory of God, for the sake of his name, that he might be known and this connection to the nations as we move on from here. Ezekiel chapter five, God has acknowledges he's positioned Jerusalem to be a great light and instead they have rebelled against him and are worse than all the other nations around them. And so in verse seven, he says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you are more turbulent than the nations that are all around you and have not walked in my statutes or obeyed my rules and have not acted according to the rules of the nations that are uh, around you, or all around you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I am against you. Can you, can you, I mean, imagine the prophet of the Lord. God, your God, has turned his wrath against you. This is the word of the Lord. And he goes on and he acknowledges that his wrath is going to come and fall on the people he gets down to verse 11, and he says, Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will withdraw. Remember the presence of God in the illustration in Ezekiel's vision. My eye will not spare, and I will have no pity. A third part of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. A third part shall fall by the sword all around you, and a third part I will scatter to all the winds and will unsheath the sword after them. Why is all this happening? Verse 13, thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself. Listen, and they shall know that I am the Lord that I have spoken in my jealousy when I spend my fury upon them. God pours out his fury on them for his glory, that they shall know that I am the Lord, verse 13. So let's pause and take a step back. When we talk about God's glory, we gotta understand God's glory is absolute. The recognition of God's glory in his sovereignty, however, is unfulfilled. You see what I'm saying? All right. For example, when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're praying for the fulfillment of the recognition of God's glory. In other words, God is not somehow less sovereign today. He is not somehow less glorious today. See, he is absolute. His glory is absolute. How we recognize him is broken. So today, when we pursue the glory of God, we don't add to his glory. That's not what we're doing. See, we proclaim his glory in abiding worship. We proclaim it. We long for it. We long to know more of it. And when I say abiding, here's what I want you to catch. I mean constant, unyielding, uncompromising, unparalleled. We know that is fully found in Christ. It is the recognition that overflows into proclamation, both privately and publicly, personally and socially. Listen, it is the conviction, the conviction of our saving faith in Christ, that the truthful revelation of who God is be made known to all of creation. That is the glory of God that we pursue. We're not adding to it. We are recognizing it. 
and calling the world and all of creation to recognize who he is. And it's one of those realities we believe in and are secure in until we're not. Until our idols are exposed. Until the glory of God is deemed secondary to something else. And we're tempted to no longer repent, to no longer turn, but to hold on to something that is more precious to ourselves. And we begin to ask why. And this theme, again, is unpacked repeatedly throughout Ezekiel in so many incredible ways. But in one way that's a little unique to the other prophets is Ezekiel personalizes this message and emphasizes that personalization in a way that really Jeremiah and Isaiah and a lot of the other prophets don't. And chapter 18 is a great chapter to go back and study so that you can see this. A lot of the prophets really focus on Israel, God's people that are set apart. But Ezekiel takes chapter 18 and really sets it aside to personalize Israel's rebellion. Just a small section, verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, it's God, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Did you catch that? Make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. Here's the rebuke. You are broken. You, not just the nation, it's not just them. It's not what's wrong with them. You stand before me guilty. And how are you going to create for you a new heart and a new spirit? What is your plan? See, I think if we're honest, that's what a lot of us do, like just daily. We look at whether that's whatever. We look at our nation. And we go, what is wrong with them? And we talk about the nation as if it's out there and we're not part of the problem. And God sets aside chapter 18 and comes right back through Ezekiel and says, you're not righteous. You're broken. You're part of the problem. Even Ezekiel is a captive who is facing suffering and hardship and consequence of sin. We're guilty in this. And there's an individual rebuke. And then he goes on into chapter 20. And he goes back to the nation and he gives precedent in history so that they would understand this isn't some isolated event. This is a mankind issue that goes all the way back to the beginning. And he goes back to Egypt and he begins to document Israel's rebellion. In verse nine, he says, I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived in whose sight I made myself known to them and bringing them out of the land of Egypt. So God's saying, look, I led you out of Egypt. I gave you law. I set you up as my people. And I acted for my namesake, verse 12, that they might know that I am the Lord. Verse 14, but I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations, in whose sight I had, been, uh, in, in whose sight I had brought them out. But again, they rebelled. Again, they rebelled. Verse 22, but I withheld my hand and acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations, in whose sight I had brought them out. Verse 26, he comes back again. I did it, God says, that they might know that I am the Lord. If you go back and you study and you read in Exodus, you're gonna see the same parallel. You'll see it all throughout the plagues and all throughout Israel's deliverance. 
For example, Exodus chapter 10, verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into the Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them. Why? That you may know that I am the Lord. Here's what's happening. Ezekiel is drawing an incredible parallel in chapter 20. God rescued Israel from the Egyptians for the same reason that he is now enslaving them to the Babylonians. For the sake of his name. It's for him. It's for his glory. And he is acting in both wrath and deliverance for the same why. For the glory of his name among the nations. And so God will unleash his wrath, but he will also restore Israel. He goes on looking forward in verse 41, as a pleasing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples. Remember, he'd scattered them everywhere and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. Verse 42, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers, and there you shall remember your ways and all your deeds which you have defiled yourselves, and you shall loathe yourselves for all the evils that you have committed. Listen to verse 44. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways, nor according to your corrupt deeds. Here's what's happening. Now in their deliverance, watch this, it is grace and mercy. And God acts and delivers the people. And he says, I do it not of any merit of yours because you're rotten, you're broken, you're shattered, but I have set you up for my name's sake, in his love and in his mercy, see, in his sovereignty, that his name might be glorified throughout all of creation. And again, I think we're good with that. We're okay with that until it comes for us. Until we see chaos around us. Until we experience personal loss. And so in chapter 21, we begin to see a little bit of a shift for the next few chapters in Ezekiel. And it gets really personal. And the cost and the loss begins to mount up. And what I want you to do is I want you to just see Ezekiel's example in this. In Ezekiel chapter 21, God says, and for you, son of man, groan with breaking heart and bitter grief, groan before their eyes. And when they say to you, why do you groan? You shall say, because of the news that is coming. Every heart will melt and all hands will be feeble. Every spirit will faint and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and it will be fulfilled, declares the Lord God. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also polished sharpened for slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. The judgment of Israel, specifically aimed at the apple of their eye, Jerusalem, is near, and it will be costly. And so in Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 15, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, Behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban. 
put your shoes on your feet, do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at the evening, my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. That verse is convicting enough. And so on the next morning, I did as I was commanded, and the people said to me, will you not tell us what these things mean for us? that you are acting thus? Then I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, the yearning of your soul. And your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men, your turban shall be on your head and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be a sign to you. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, you will know that I am the Lord God. He goes on after that and he says, Ezekiel, after this happens, you'll get your voice back. And in verse 27, again, he says, they will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel's actions not to mourn, that's not a direct charge to us, but they describe a worldview we need to acknowledge. First, making God's glory known was primary. Was primary. Even when God took the love of his life. For an illustration. So that his glory could be proclaimed throughout the nations. Even in that moment, God's glory is primary. Second, Ezekiel's wife's identity and value is in God. She lives and she dies for the glory of God. This is why when we celebrate our funerals, we are reminded that the death of the saints is precious to the Lord because it is a testimony of the redemption that takes place through Christ. And third, Ezekiel's life was not his own, it was not his own. He was not set apart for himself. God is the author and the subject and we live fully for him. That section messed with me for a number of years. It was hard for me because I realized there were things in my life that if taken from me, I would struggle. I'm not saying I would mourn. I'm saying I would struggle. Because truth be told, those things were idols. They were primary. Here's what I would ask you. In faith, in the gospel that acknowledges all of your value and your worth is in him. In a principle that we hold up from scripture that we exist for the glory of God. Do you dare search your heart to explore what you hold up more primary than abiding worship? This is what life of repentance looks like as we are conformed more and more into the image of Christ. As the team comes up, one more section I wanna take us to, and we'll pick up here next week. It's in Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm just gonna read it to you. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, it is not for your sake, O 
house of Israel, that I am about to act. Again, for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations, gather you from all countries, and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. He goes on, verse 31. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It's not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways. Say, what does that mean? To the sinner, It means that we should be ashamed and confounded in despair in our brokenness and to the redeemed that we should be amazed and humbled and in awe that God in his glory would reveal himself to us, redeem what was broken and call us to himself. See, God has a sovereign plan and he is at work for his glory. It is not your glory. And if you're here and you're separated from him, if you're watching and there's never been a moment of repentance and saving faith where you acknowledge that his glory is primary, that he loved you so much that he would send his son to hang on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin because it's for his name's sake. never done that, how will you fix your heart? How will you make yourself a clean heart before him? But he has done the work for you. In Christ, he offers to give you a new heart, verse 26, a new spirit I will put within you, a new heart of flesh to replace your heart of stone. Repent and live. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean you can turn and act better and do better and fix yourself. It means you must acknowledge, I am broken. I have nothing. And all life and all glory is in God. And you give your life to Christ in faith, acknowledging who he is. And to the redeemed, live in abiding worship, your identity, not in yourself, but in Christ and in Christ alone. And I think that's why Paul says to the Corinthians, for the sake of Christ, that I am content. I find it well with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, calamities. When I am weak, then I am strong. Because I don't exist for my glory. We exist for the glory of God. Would you stand and would you continue to respond in praise and worship? Hey, church family, as you've read God's word this week, 
and heard it taught today, we hope that you have been challenged and encouraged. God's word in our lives and the Holy Spirit's work always calls for a response. And oftentimes we need help discerning what that response is, and we would love to help. If you'll click the link below this video labeled Respond, follow the steps, a member of our team will reach out to you this week. We hope to see you soon.